Good evening. I'm Richard Madsen. Tonight, an update on international efforts to stop the nuclear weapons program in North Korea. And then a look into the underground film industry in China with clips from two forbidden movies. That's tonight on Viewpoint Asia. It's been a year since the U.S. accused North Korea of having a secret nuclear weapons program against a number of international commitments. And now North Korea says it has the material to build six nuclear bombs. For a sense of what that means, we turn to Stefan Haggard. He's a professor at UCSD's Graduate School of International Relations and Pacific Studies who specializes in North Korea. Welcome, Steph. Thanks, Dick. Happy to be here. Well, about a year ago, the North Koreans uh, unlocked the doors to their nuclear uh, reprocessing plants, their petroleum reprocessing plants, kicked out international inspectors, and suggested they were going ahead and start developing new nuclear weapons. U.S. tried to respond with a series of threats and invitation to negotiate. We talked about this last February when you were on this program. Uh, since then, there have been a lot of new developments, not necessarily for the better. Uh, there were some negotiations in August, which initially looked ho hopeful, but then uh, seemed to have ended badly. Uh, so you, could you pick up the story from there and tell us where we're going? Well, I wish I knew where we were going. Uh, the negotiations that took place in August were the second in a series of six-party talks that involved not only the United States and North Korea, but also China, uh, Russia, and Japan as well as the South Koreans. And the purpose of those talks was essentially to try to save face. Uh, North Korea had initially wanted to speak directly to the United States. The United States didn't want that to happen. They wanted this to take place in a uh, multilateral forum. Uh, and the Chinese were able to bridge that gap by offering a setting where they would take the lead in pulling the two sides together and allowing both to, to uh, stand down from their initial positions on how the negotiations should be conducted. So that was the hopeful part. That was the hopeful part. The not so hopeful part is it's been extraordinarily difficult to make any progress in these talks. And the, uh, the central problem as I see it is basically one of trust between the two sides. Uh, North Korea has believed, I think, since uh, the Bush administration came to office, probably in the middle of 2000, maybe after, after that, that uh, the United States was not interested in dealing with them in a, in a fair manner. We would made a lot of progress at the tail end of the Clinton administration in negotiating with respect to a missile deal. Of course, back in 94, there had been an agreement that had shut down these nuclear facilities in the first place. But after the Bush administration came, came in, U.S. policy turned in a more hawkish direction. So the North Koreans don't trust the United States. Looks like the Bush administration doesn't trust North Korea. So uh, where can you take it from there? Well, uh, the United States has good reason for not trusting the North Koreans, and I, unfortunately, I think the North Koreans also have good reason not for trusting the United States. From Pyongyang's perspective, uh, the last 10 years have not been happy in terms of the overall security environment for them. Uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, they lost first the Soviet Union as a critical ally, then China experienced a very deep famine in the mid-90s. After the Bush administration came to office, a lot of rhetoric about uh, going after countries that had weapons programs, and a lot of harsh rhetoric about North Korea in particular. If you recall, in the State of the Union, President Bush lumped North Korea with uh, Iraq and Iran as part of an axis of evil, subsequently issued a uh, statement, national security statement, in which the U.S. took on the, the uh, right to preempt against, uh, against countries that had develop nuclear weapons. So I think particularly after the United States chose to go into Iraq, North Korea really thought that it was next. So the United States has taken this very confrontational position toward North Korea. Now, the North Koreans have responded with more confrontation, it seems, right? Uh, could you talk a little well, bit about no that? There's no question that North Korean strategy is, uh, is to ratchet up the pressure on the United States to reach a negotiated settlement. The position of the Bush administration has been very divided on this question. Uh, uh, President Bush himself, I think, has expressed openly his hostility towards the North Korean leadership. Uh, mentioning such issues as the starvation of the people, the civil rights, human rights uh, conditions in the country, which are obviously quite, uh, quite bad. Um, but he's consistently taken the position that the U.S. will not be blackmailed, will not negotiate under threat. 
That's a reasonable for the thing for the United States to do, but in the end, we have to look at the other side about what is going to induce the North Koreans to give up this program. And I think the, the administration is still divided on its willingness to undertake that kind of negotiation. In those negotiations in, in August, there looked to be some progress initially being made, even promises to perhaps have a, some talks now in October, which I guess aren't going to happen. Uh, but then at the end of the talks, uh, all of a sudden, North Koreans said, uh, we're not interested in further talks. It's useless to, to discuss anything with you. Uh, and in fact, we've been uh, continuing our nuclear program. We might even have enough weapons, you know, for six, six weapons or more. Uh, and we might even be getting ready to test one. Uh, this doesn't seem to be the kind of thing you would want to do if you're going to have any kind of conciliation or trust building right. going on. What, what, what explains that behavior? Well, I think that the tone of the talks in August was certainly an improvement over the tone of the talks in April, because there had been a previous exercise of this sort in April that involved the three parties. Uh, and uh, uh, this, these talks, however, I think the, the U.S. brought essentially the same types of proposals that they had brought to the, to the table in April. There really hadn't been very much change in the American position. And the core of the American position is that North Korea really has to go first. They have to take the actions to demonstrate their credibility to the rest of the world. Anything having to do with assurances, diplomatic relations, financial incentives, those will come after the North Koreans act. I think the North Korean perspective is this has to be a mutual exercise. We need to see some show of confidence on the part of the U.S. They're very concerned about whether the U.S. is going to hold up its side of the promises. From their perspective, some of those promises haven't been fulfilled either, such as the promise of moving towards diplomatic recognition. Well, confrontation seems not to have worked at this moment. What, what more could the U.S. begin to do to uh, break through this? Well, it's a, a delicate carrot stick kind of game that the administration is, is playing. And I wish I could say that this was a result of a coherent strategy. I think it's more a result of some tugs and pulls within the administration itself between those who believe that there should be a negotiation, even if we don't call it that, that would look for some quid pro quo, some things that we could give the North Koreans that would make them comfortable enough to abandon the program. The other side of the street are those who really believe that the only way that the North Koreans will be brought to the table to make concessions is ultimately through the exercise of pressure. And so far, I would say that the tilt has been marginally, if not more than marginally, in the direction of that latter hawkish group. The hard line. Uh, what about uh, our, our allies in, in the region in this case? What about the Chinese? Uh, what about, in fact, about the South Koreans? Uh, what about the Chinese, first of all? They've been well, helpful. The, yeah, the Chinese have really played an extraordinary role. It's one of the ironies of the post 9-11 period that U.S. relations with China are probably better than they've been in some time. And China has really uh, displayed quite extraordinary leadership in standing up and seeking to provide a forum that would allow the U.S. And the, and the North Koreans to back away from this intransigence with respect to talks themselves. So I really think that they have, uh, have taken a, really taken a quite remarkable uh, position on this issue. Of course, they're, not, uh, they're interested in the outcome of this. They're not unself-interested. Um, they're concerned about instability on the, on the Korean Peninsula. They border North Korea. They're concerned about the regime collapsing, flood of refugees coming into, uh, into that part of China. So they're, them, they're themselves interested in seeing this resolved peacefully. Unlike the Americans, the Chinese actually have some real leverage on North Korea, don't they? They, they, they have uh, fuel lines. Uh, they're sell, selling fuel to the North Koreans. They could cut that off if they want to put some pressure on. They could do other things, right? Uh, they certainly could. Uh, I think Chinese foreign policy is such that they're very reluctant to use that sort of muscle publicly. But we do have some indications that they've been having very hard discussions with the North Koreans and indicated their displeasure at the fact that the North Koreans are going ahead with a nuclear program. Then South Korea, uh, you would think, would be backing up the United States 100 percent, but at least among younger generation of South Korea, there seems to be uh, hostility to the United States, even. Uh, I was just in, in South Korea over the summer, and I think this was really one of the most interesting observations to come out of that trip, at least to me, was the extent to which the division exists within Korean public opinion on this issue. It's largely a generational divide. You have very strong differences of view between an older generation, some of which were very badly affected by the war, uh, the Korean War, 
on the division of the peninsula, a younger generation that has grown up entirely uh, in the post-Cold War period, many of them, have really had their formative experiences since the collapse of communism. Their views of the situation are much more accepting, tolerant of North Korea. They're not worried about a nuclear bomb uh, just on their doorstep? Well, you know, they've been under conventional military threat all their lives. Uh, the North Koreans have the capacity to hit virtually any part of South Korea with conventional weapons. Does it make a difference that there's a nuclear capability on top of that? It's not really clear. Uh, they've been under the shadow of that threat for some time. Uh, just today, the North Korean uh, news agency uh, put out a statement which seemed to suggest, although it's not 100% clear, that they are willing to go ahead fairly soon in actually testing a nuclear bomb. Uh, what if they do that? Well, uh, first of all, we have to look very carefully at that statement. I took a close look at it before coming over to the studio here today. It still has that conditional quality to it. I don't think this is something the Koreans want to do. It's more saying that if we feel that we cannot make progress, that our interests are not being attended to, this is something we have to consider. So I think it's still qualified. I don't think they're making a commitment to test. I think they're still leaving themselves an out. But it's kind of at a crucial point now. If we, either side makes a mistake, it could go up to a much more dangerous level. I think if the North Koreans tested, it would really tilt, uh, tilt things in a more hawkish direction in, the U in U.S. policy, unfortunately, because it would be very difficult for us to, to deal with them on, on that basis. Well, this is unfolding. I'm sure we'll be having you back before long. For now, thank you very, very much, Steph. Thanks for having me, Dick. I enjoyed it. Government censors in China still tightly restrict the public distribution of movies. Nonetheless, there now flourishes a lively underground film industry. We'll talk about the products of that industry tonight with Jim Chung. He's the curator of an extensive collection of Chinese underground film for the UCSD Library. Welcome, Jim. Thanks, Richard. Could you tell us a little bit about Chinese underground film? Why do they call it underground? How does it get produced? Uh, Chinese underground film actually started in the uh, early 90s. And basically, these films are not sponsored by government. And they are uh, pub uh, privately raised funding with a small budgets and the film uh, directors are not uh, relate to the, any big uh, government control studios. And uh, uh, normally these films are related to the uh, areas government control media will not uh, report them or uh, less or uh, under reported. Who are the producers and directors and what kind of background do they have? Where do they get their funding? Most of the film directors are, uh, get professional training. They are graduates from the uh, prestigious Beijing Film uh, Academy. And some of film directors are just uh, basically uh, getting the degrees from the various uh, universities. Uh, they get funding, most of the time they're getting private funding. And sometimes they're getting the foreign fundings. And only a very small amount of them get funding from government in the beginning. But when uh, their film's ready, the, census, uh, the government census didn't prove their films. Can they make a decent living that way by uh, working outside the government system? Uh, actually, uh, it depends. Uh, some of film directors already became, uh, they from the underground now moved to the upground. <laughs> and they are living very nicely. Some of them we know they are driving now Ferrari in Beijing. And uh, most of film directors actually, they are kind of affiliated with the, uh, the government jobs. So they have a side job like working as professors in the universities. Now these films, they can't be distributed publicly in China, but they do get distributed widely outside of China. Who do they get distributed no. to? No. They are not distributed in China, for sure. And even outside China, they are uh, with very limited access to getting these kind of films. Uh, only, I know, to my knowledge, only very few of them, uh, they have already sold the copyrights to the foreign distributors. Where did you get them for the library? How do you? For me, and we get to the uh, kind of, we call it unorthodox channels. Um, in most cases, we got them directly from the film directors. And sometimes we got from, the, uh, again, the foreign, foreign distributors. But which is a very small amount of film we got from foreign distributors. Now in China, if, if you make such a film and even watch it privately, can you get in a lot of trouble or is it uh, just the government sort of ignores it? Or what are the sanctions for making these films in China? 
That's a very interesting question. Uh, actually, we discussed these issues with many film directors and uh, the scholars. Uh, there is kind of self-imposed censorship among the film directors. So all these films are uh, not, none of them is directly against Chinese government. None of them is directly against the Communist Party. So there's kind of self-imposed censorship there. So uh, in that case, the government normally ignore them. And uh, sometimes they just um, give like a little warning, warning signs. If like their film uh, shows in the, especially at university campuses getting too big, the government will try to shut them down, say no more. But basically government does not crack down on these films and these film directors. Let's look at a few examples now. Uh, Shanghai Panic, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Shanghai Panic is a, a film about a small group of urban uh, young professionals. They are living a very well life because of the uh, economic reform and uh, the uh, improving living standard in Shanghai. They enjoy all the modern entertainments. They went to disco bar, but following this kind of uh, improved economic situation and globali globalization, they are also uh, now facing the problems like uh, using drugs, and they are basically really scared of um, getting AIDS. And uh, so these kind of things, uh, the government control media will not report them because these are the, um, not good for the uh, glorious image of uh, uh, called socialist uh, China. <laughs> Well, that pretty much shatters our stereotypes of China being a repressed, uh, tightly regulated place. Uh, these young people are doing basically criminal activity, and this is a documentary. How common is this kind of behavior? Uh, this kind of behavior actually is quite common among the, uh, the city people, especially well educated and uh, they call westernized uh, group of young professionals. They have money, they have access to all the, uh, the modern uh, westernized, whatever the new civilization. 
and the filmmaker is trying to document this. And, uh, you know, in the West, one problem I think people might have if you made a film of young people like that was that they could get uh, prosecuted, they could get arrested for taking drugs and so forth. There'd be evidence right there. Do they worry about that in China? Because these issues are still new issues facing Chinese governments. And the Chinese government still does not know how to deal with it, such as AIDS and the drugs. They try in the way they try to ignore them. And they, you know, I think, but sooner or later, they will have to face it, just like SARS. In the beginning, just Chinese government does not know how to react to these kind of things. So this, these films really represent a picture of a society in which the government once had control but is losing control and young people are caught up in this uh, feeling of kind of lawlessness and rootlessness. Now you have another film that's in the countryside that's very different in style. It's about a group of Christians, in fact. Uh, what's the name of that film? And the film is called Jesus Bless You. And this is a film about uh, a group of the villagers in the northern part of China, they try to practice the Christianity uh, with the Chinese characteristics. Again, they try to adopt uh, the Christian, uh, Christian doctrines in the Chinese format. Okay, let's take a look at that, okay? <laughs> Well, I can see why the government censors would not like the first movie. Uh, it deals with irresponsible, lawless behavior. But now the second one is about people who are claiming that, uh, talking about being socially responsible by having filial piety toward their parents, by not stealing and being good people. Uh, why would the censors have a problem with that? Well, again, uh, have, uh, it has been already for a while. The communism kind of have lost uh, has lost its attraction to the Chinese people. And the religious practice is uh, it's, uh, booming in China. And uh, of course, the Chinese government does not like to see that happen, especially some uh, the Christian areas considered as the foreign influence. Uh, during early time, we, uh, the Chinese government were even considered the missionaries as the imperialist uh, uh, influence. So these are, are, are Christians, Chinese Christians, right. Chinese but Christians. Uh, the way in which they're singing seems very Chinese. It doesn't look like out of a Western Christian hymnal. Right. Yeah, these are the uh, areas actually has a strong early missionary influence in the northern part of China. And the early missionaries, they, are do, uh, they did adopt the Chinese folklore format to try to convert the Chinese villagers. So they are just continuing the missionaries efforts now. Is this kind of beha uh, behavior, this kind of Christian belief and practice, is it illegal in China or is it legal? Is it underground or is it above ground? It has never been clear. Uh, there's no one say it's illegal. Also, no one say it's, Ill uh, it's illegal. So governments basically ignore them. So until I think this kind of practice is getting too much attention or the government feel threatened, they will try to crack down them. Otherwise, they will government just uh, ignore them. How would a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, get access to a community like this and get the trust of the people so that they could take this film? Uh, and what would be their motivation? Where were they going to show this film in China? 
Most of film uh, independent or they call independent or underground film directors, they like to record or express to their film something they believe it's the real things happen in China. And they believe what they do is to make historical records. And it's something government uh, controlled media uh, normally ignore them. So he, they will make this kind of films, they think will make historic records to show people, maybe show people in future. So these two films are both documentaries. You also in your collection have many other films that are feature films, fictional films. Uh, obviously they show a side of life in China that we don't, don't normally get, at least in American media. Uh, they show totally different social worlds, the rootless young people, lawless young people in Shanghai versus these rural devout Christians, uh, the great avenue into Chinese society. Uh, if people want to see these films, these available to the public, are they? how would they come and, and, and get access to them? And, how would they know what you have in the library? Uh, with the supports from the faculty and the library administration and the library staff, we have already established a Chinese underground film collection with about 125 films. Uh, they are all located, uh, located inside the main library, which is our Gezo Library. And at UCSD. These, at UCSD. These films are open to public and anyone living in the California and the, they can come inside library view them. However, they cannot be checked out of the library. Only the faculty at UCSD can check them out for the class use. Okay, other people though, can just go to the reference librarian section and ask for them right. and get they just watch can, them there. They can just walk into the, uh, the, our film collection and say, I want to see certain movies inside libraries. Yes. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. That's our program for tonight. Thank all of you for joining us on Viewpoint Asia. I'm Richard Madsen. Good night.